Be a bit more expressive. Um, you might say you speak truth to power or uh, discuss the politics. So hopefully with this presentation, if I sit down and look at the, uh, the microphone, um, I'll, I'll behave myself. Um, so um, <clears throat> if we started the recording now, I'll just say my name is Pete Gaskell and I work for the wonderful Countryside and Community um, Research Institute at the marvellous University of Gloucestershire. And um, I want to talk today about um, conservation, um, heritage conservation under CAP Agri-Environment Schemes. So briefly, the presentation outline is um, why do we need this sort of research? Um, looking at a working definition of the historic environment, um, under agri-environment schemes in England, there's a very specific definition and, and that needs to be explained. Then have a look at a little bit about the, um, the history and background of agri-environment schemes in England and actually look at the evidence. I mean, you know, what evidence have we gathered over the last 30 years of the impact of um, prescriptions and options under the agri-environment schemes specifically related to the historic environment. Um, and then finally wrap up with some conclusions and uh, policy recommendations. So just as a little bit of background, um, like uh, you know, elsewhere in Europe, by the late 20th century, it, it was widely recognized that agriculture, modern agriculture, could be detrimental to environmental management, and a lot of damage was taking place. Therefore, governments, and you know, within the EU, um, there was a, uh, a need for intervention. And so we have policy now for the, agri um, for the agricultural environment. But within that context of what is the agricultural environment, um, it's quite important to understand that, that sort of like nature and natural resources tend to dominate the discourse and the discussion. Um, and most of the emphasis uh, focuses on that. And in, 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 in England in particular, but we use agri-environment schemes to deliver EU directives, you know, birds, habitats, water, climate change. So there's a, we use our agro-environment scheme, particularly in the last 20 years, to deliver um, EU directives. And they're mainly focused on, 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 on the natural environment. Um, and there's a related, um, sorry, it, uh, there's a related sort of like concept here that, that the environment is understood through science nature is understood through science and so our concepts of heritage and historic environment and landscape are very um, very difficult to incorporate within this framework and also as I say it's, it's not an area of EU competence so I would say not trying to be uh, too controversial but um, nature tends to dominate culture in discourse and policy and that has over the last 30 years influenced the allocation of resources, um, particularly in staff within agencies and the amount of money that's allocated um, to different types of management on farmland. Um, and that creates a problem for the historic environment. And hoping not to be too controversial, but I think culture is seen as not being scientific. And certainly within, within England um, and, and DEFRA, and our major um, uh, body, which is, is Natural England, uh, the focus is on, on science um, and, 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 and nature. And the historic environment is, it's to, you know, to people who are trained in science, you know, ecologists uh, and, and so forth, it's very difficult to understand, um, you know, what the historic environment is. And it tends to confuse natural scientists. And I think um, one of the previous talks was saying that, you know, archaeology speaking to the Department of Agriculture is often quite, uh, you know, it hasn't happened in the past and is quite, um, you know, a sensitive uh, thing. And, and, and the more of those interrelationships that you can build, you know, the, you know, the better. Um, but I think overall, I would say that, that, that the historic environment is tend to be portrayed within government policy as, as less of a priority 
than than nature, because nature is is you know the the, the Earth's life support system. You know, I'm quite often in meetings where people say, you yeah, know, well, historic environment is interesting, but we are saving the planet. Um, and that's a difficult conversation to have, particularly when you're arguing for uh, resources. Um, but the challenge is, uh, the opportunity is, because now we are leaving the, uh, the EU, that, um, you know, the UK and, and, you know, and England, that we have a, an opportunity to do things differently. And hopefully, by demonstrating the importance of the historic environment um, to, to policymakers, um, we can get maybe a more appropriate share of resources. And to do that, we need to reconstruct you know, a robust evidence base um, and a framework which will provide baseline on the extent and condition of resources. And I think some of the previous speakers have been talking about the way that that data has been collected and, and put together. And we need to monitor changes, condition, um, and condition through time, and I identify the impact of historic environment on the, uh, of the different drivers of change, of which one is agri-environment schemes, uh, but there are other you know, economic and social drivers as well. Um, and the last two are on, on this list is really to determine value for money, um, because you know, uh, resources are tight, therefore these schemes have to deliver in terms of the historic environment, and, and finally if we have this information, collect this evidence, we can inform policy. Um, working definition of the agro-environment for um, agro-environment, so uh, ESAs, uh, so the historic environment for ESAs, um, is very particular within uh, England. Um, it consists of archaeological sites, historic features such as the farm buildings that um, we've, we've heard about, um, historic field boundaries and ancient trees, and designated landscapes. And it kind of merges into to, 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 um, landscape, but landscape is seen as a different um, objective within these agri-environment schemes. Um, so what we have in, in, in England is um, four schemes over the last 30 years that have had a kind of like major impact on the agri-environment, but environmentally sensitive areas, uh, the Countryside Stewardship Scheme, um, the environment, Environmental Stewardship Scheme, and because we've run out of ways to name things, we call it it's the New Countryside Stewardship Scheme. Um, so, um, what we've, um, I'll briefly, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll skip this one in terms of, t of time, but, but basically, most of these schemes have common features. Um, but in terms of uh, historic environment activity, um, annual payments to conserve and maintain features runs through all these schemes, and then capital payments to enhance um, and restore uh, features. So when we saw the um, farm building restoration, uh, that would be classed as, a, as, a, as like capital payments rather than annual maintenance uh, payments. And Here's a, uh, an example of t um, the Pennine Dales landscape, um, which was a, an environmentally sensitive area uh, scheme. And the maintenance element would be to repair small defects to these field barns and to repair and maintain the, uh, the, the walls that are, are in good condition. But if these features had become um, derelict, then you could get a capital grant uh, for restoration. And, and here's a, like a farmer. Um, um, as I say, repairing a quite a, a, a derelict piece of wall and being filmed by a cameraman for some strange reason, which uh, I don't really know. Uh, so what um, I've been involved in really over the last um, 10 to 15 years is actually gathering evidence on what the impacts of these schemes have on the um, historic environment and was involved in a major study uh, by a chap called Nigel Boatman in 2008. Uh, where we pulled together everything could, that had been written on the UK um, agri-environment scheme in terms of uh, the historical environment um, and did a literature review. And it was part of a broader study and this also illustrates, I think, um, where the, the, you know, the research and the evidence base is at, at the moment. I mean, this was looking at the 2008 figures, but over 75% of the studies and the amount um, you know, written um, about these 
um, um, agrivironment screens was to do with biodiversity and habitats. You know, it really dominates um, the academic landscape. 12% um, um, of studies uh, and output um, was to do with the historic environment and I was involved um, with that analysis. And we used uh, um, two sources of information, um, reports, basically scientific monitoring, long term with baselines, um, which is mostly focused on the biodiversity uh, and um, habitats uh, literature. And then historic environment, most evidence is through evaluations, which are short term, you know, based on expert appraisals, uses proxies, because we, we don't do long term monitoring, and we infer uh, the impacts. And, and I've been involved with a number of studies there and, and pulled them um, together. And what we've, we've done, um, there was this 2008 study, and I've been recently updating that for the historic environment, the studies that have been um, published since 2008, which including the, uh, the newer agri-environment schemes. And we produced two types of um, evidence. Uh, two types of evidence. We, we produced tables, which look at the indicators, for example, like um, historic <coughs> buildings, uh, what the key findings of the report were, summarise you know, summarise those, and, and you know what the reference is. So we create a large database of all um, the the studies, um, and then we create a separate table which looks at each study in terms of really um, what what is the um, sort of um, the value of the data that's been uh, collected. Um, you know, does it um, stand up to uh, scientific scrutiny, and that worked particularly well for the biodiversity um, types of um, study and habitats. But taking this like scientific approach, and if you look at some of the uh, categories that we've got in this table, about um, sampling approach and um, statistics and baselines and things like that, most of the uh, studies in the historic environment don't, don't have that. Um, and then we use a, a traffic light system of red um, for um, limited or no impact on the historic environment, um, amber for meeting some of the objectives and, and, and um, effectiveness, um, and green for actually delivering uh, quantifiable um, benefits, which um, are seen to be effective in terms of delivery. So we have a sort of like a two scales there, um, impacts, beneficial outcomes and effectiveness, which is delivery. Um, and when we look at um, the types of studies, um, we've look, we looked at 60 studies um, for the, the Boatman study, uh, and now we're looking at, um, I think we're, the currently we're at about 30, 35 studies that we've been able to identify for the post-2008 uh, period. And if anybody's interested in the original study, it's Boatman et al. Um, and it's produced uh, for the Land Use Policy Group and you can download that off the internet. And these here are just some examples of um, studies that we've, that we've looked at. There's one on traditional farm buildings that I was involved in, one on historic landscapes and one on landscape character. And although landscape character is a separate area of um, um, research in this study, that, that quite a lot of the uh, information that goes into these studies can be used for assessing historic environment as well, such as length and condition of boundaries, farm buildings, and things like that. But most landscape studies don't include archaeology. Five minutes. Five? Oh, I think we're okay. Almost. So, environmentally sensitive areas, this is our first scheme uh, that we had in, in England that ran um, basically from the late 80s uh, up to about 2005. Um, in terms of the uh, impact, for the historic environment, things like um, repairing walls, um, protecting archaeological sites, um, restoring farm buildings, things like that. Th 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 these schemes actually delivered quite well in terms of having measurable benefit uh, beneficial outcomes. And as I think you said in the previous um, uh, talk with the, uh, the, the archaeology, um, it's very easy to see the effect of a management prescription 
Whereas perhaps with some of the habitat and biodiversity prescriptions, one might have to see wait 20, 30 years to see if there's an impact. And there is quite a bit of evidence to show that some um, changing in, say, for example, grazing density on upland moorlands hasn't had a positive impact as well because the regimes aren't fully understood. But for the historic environment, basically, um, you, you know, um, there is a very close relationship with the type of action and the output that you can get, and it's quite easily uh, measured. Um, in terms of effectiveness, in terms of that's, that's delivery and value for money, again, the, the uh, ESAs were seen as quite cost effective. Countryside stewardship, which was an experimental scheme uh, in England, which was trying lots of different things, um, wasn't as closely uh, defined, I think, as, as, as ESAs in terms of what they were expecting to get uh, in terms of output. So we class that really sort of like in the amber uh, categories and, and sometimes it wasn't particularly uh, effective in its delivery. And then more recently an environmental stewardship scheme, again it's performed quite well and the environmental stewardship scheme, interestingly, it learned lessons from countryside stewardship and environmentally sensitive areas. So the delivery was quite, quite good and our new countryside stewardship scheme is insufficient, insufficient information because it's only been going a few years. So then we broke it down into archaeological sites, historic features, field boundaries and designated landscapes, these, these components of the historic environment, and then did basically the same sorts of analysis. And with archaeological sites, the impact has been very strong, very positive, um, but the effectiveness um, we scored it as an amber because in some cases some of the um, prescriptions and options uh, for farmland, farmers didn't particularly take them up in great numbers because it interfered with their production, which goes back really to the, one of the, uh, the first talks about, about precision farming and what farmers want to do with their land and the, the damage that they can then take. Um, historic features, um, impact has been pretty good, but varies you know, uh, between, say, for example, walls and, uh, and, and buildings. Um, some of the prescriptions for buildings um, in the earlier schemes um, were seen to damage some of the historic value of these buildings. So it was quite good for landscape because they remained in the landscape and looked like these vernacular structures. But when you got into the detailed um, restoration, there were some practices that were seen <laughs> not, to, not to be quite good. But they were very popular with farmers, so um, in terms of delivery, it was quite effective. And field boundaries have you know, very effective and has had a strong, you know, uh, impact. And the same for uh, design landscapes. So, minute. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, so the conclusions from this sort of like big literature review and trying to draw this evidence uh, together um, is that it's these options for the historic environment, very popular with farmers and land managers. Um, demand is high. Uh, demand is often greater than supply. Um, their purpose is easily understood, and I think this links also in with this uh, the previous talk when we were talking about um, how heritage and culture uh, and social glue and the farmers actually appreciate the heritage. They can easily understand the purpose of these, um, you know, heritage interventions. Um, whereas maybe some of the very detailed biodiversity managements, um, you know, leave them a little bit confused, or I mean, actually they can't contest the management prescriptions that are being prescribed. They don't think they will deliver what they're they're, they're, they're hoping to, um, and they definitely meet the um, the objectives of the scheme. And there's, you know, for the historic environment, there's often clear physical evidence of the condition, the change that has taken place, um, and they're pretty effective. Um, which when you look at value for money um, and the expected valuations that have taken place, it's pretty high. Um, and that, again, there are economic benefits for local communities because people spend, um, or farmers and land managers spend locally and their skills are local. So there's a knock on effect for local uh, communities. But unfortunately, I mean, only 5% of the uh, current agri-environment uh, budget is actually spilled, uh, sorry, spent on um, historic environment op uh, options. Uh, so finally, uh, policy considerations. Um, it's been effective 
Um, it only has a little um, slice of the uh, overall um, agri-environment funding, but it delivers what it, it, it says it's going to deliver, you know, and demand outstrips supply. So maybe there's um, options for looking at, or, you know, um, opportunities for looking at investing more. Um, but we currently have a lack of evidence. I think one of the things that we concluded from the literature review is that, that, that there isn't that level of scientific um, evidence in terms of monitoring that biodiversity has. And seeing that um, how our evidence-based policy making system in the U or in England and, and the UK in general likes evidence presented in a scientific way, there's, there's ways of improving that, I think, that we could uh, consider. And then, um, at the moment, we have a series of austerity measures in that actually uh, threatens the delivery of historic environment options, and that's lack of staff, lack of resources, so that's an issue that policymakers should uh, take on board. But post-practice, there could be opportunities, you know, for a better integration. So, there we have it. <laughs>